late, but it's okay. Uh, my name is Nika. I am a uh, 3D artist, but uh, more importantly for this talk, I am add-on developer and I am a moderator on the new extensions platform, which was uh, launched with the previous version, 4.2. And I wanted to talk about a very specific review that we get all the time, which is the pinnacle of uh, a praise you can get on our platform that it should be implemented, or, or more confrontational uh, warning of it. How is this not in Blender? How, how have they not implemented this? And it's a very fair question, and uh, I like that it's passionate because even though these people have discovered this functionality extension, even though they use it, like it, what they want is to make it available for everyone, right? That's, uh, they care about it being available for everyone, which is a noble thing. But I am here to argue that it will actually make everything worse for everyone. Because in fact, it did. We have now uh, experience basically of one release, which is a small time, but one release of the new way of handling add-ons. And we have years of experience in how it was. And I wanted to ask some questions that people uh, constantly ask and try to answer based on my uh, experience as add-on developer. Uh, because the thing is that not only Blender is not shipping any more Python stuff inside it, it also removed almost everything that was at one point in it and put it on a platform. And oops, it was for a reason, right? It wasn't just for... Like, some people think that it was to like shrink file sizes. Uh, that's not it. Nobody really cares about file sizes that much. But it was like a design decision. Like everything that happens in Blender, it is something behind it. It's a design behind it that people think, and I agree that in this case, that will make Blender better. So why did that happen? First question. Why not just ship them? And I'll just start this with... Uh, like a story because I am a maintainer developer of one of those add-ons that used to ship with Blender, which is Bull Tool. And this August, I took almost two weeks of everything. I wanted to port uh, one of the also abandoned uh, add-ons Carver into Bull Tool and create it, like modernize it because it was a pre uh, 2.7 even, I think, add-on, it was a very ancient code, ancient UI. I wanted to modernize it, I wanted to put it into a modern tool settings and it took me around two weeks. It was like 3,000 lines, which is a lot for Python code. And based on my Git uh, history, I started on August 3, I finished on August 12. And that was the time when I, uh, wanted to do this talk and I got the idea for this talk because I have also experience of uh, contributing Python code to Core Blender. Before that, I sometimes still do, but not, not that much, uh, but I have experience and I, I was in a good place to compare the workflows. And I realized that if I tried to do this in Core Blender, the workflow would look something like this. It will be just just trust me on this one, just dragged to at least three or four months. Just waiting for reviews, getting everything checked, and being asked to split everything and correct comment styles, and getting approval about every icon you use. It is a nightmare. I have started contributing to Blender because I am passionate about it, I like it, I wanted to like give back, but after a while I basically discovered that I do not like it. I don't like contributing to Blender because the process, even though how, how rewarding it is, it is grueling process. It is difficult. You do not enjoy being dragged through the review process. If you, if you work like a full-time developer, as a full-time developer, it's okay. You're used to this. It's your job. It's something that you can allocate most of your time to. But I'm just a contributor. I'm, I'm an artist. I have a job on the side. I have projects. I have a cat that needs constant attention. I cannot dedicate this much time to Blender, right? So this process wasn't really working for me, but now I felt very liberated by this new process. So the, the follow-up question you might ask is that why not just let the developers work freely as I do now, and as we all do now, but still ship the final product with the Blender? Well, that is tricky because uh, even if Blender decides to be as lenient as possible, and honestly, because of uh, how long I've been doing this, I think I will have gotten away with much less reviews and much less uh, like technical uh, stuff, but you still have 
a lot of responsibilities if something is inside Blender. It has to pass tests. I don't know if, if uh, I don't see many red linears, you probably don't have experience with failing lint tests, which is demoralizing. It's so bad. It feels so bad, bad about it. You shouldn't, you always also have limits about which functionalities you're going to introduce because you can't just introduce something that, for example, abuses devs graph, the dependency graph. You can't implement something that goes against the design of Blender. So you need to be in constant check to get uh, the ideas approved, if not the code. And you have to also deal with the rejection when those ideas are not approved. You also have to try to not get into conflict with other add-ons, no same shortcuts, no same namespaces, everything. No matter how much you simplify it, just because it is in Blender, just, just by that measure, it is a lot of work. And that is simply a work that I didn't want to do. I didn't want to contribute that much time, that much of my time. And I started going into extensions. And then the biggest one I discovered was that the biggest limitation of working on Python scripts inside Blender is that you are tied to release cycle of Blender. No matter when you want to release your add-ons, you can't. You always have to release them when the Blender releases. And this is a very stressful place to be in because I've, I've had an example where two minutes before the, the release candidate started, I had to push something because I made a, like a mistake and I had only two minutes left to fix it. It's a very stressful thing. But more than that, it just tells you when to work on what. It tells you that during alpha, you work on new features. During beta, you only on bug fixes. In during beta, you can't really push stuff into it anymore and stuff like that, which is limiting if you, your life isn't aligned to Blender, Blender's release cycles. And mine isn't, certainly. I sometimes have only time to work on this stuff when they are in beta, for example. And that means that I simply can't new, create new features. I have to focus on bug fixes. I might not want that. I might want to work on new features. I, I could, of course, but that means like, and holding the, uh, it's, it's a nightmare. This also means that you cannot maintain multiple bl Blender versions at the same time because you're always tied to the version you're working on and developing for the version you're working on. So for example, if you are on uh, Blender 4.4 uh, and you finished developing uh, 4.3, for but somebody who is uh, making a project in 4.3 and uh, just can't move on. I, I don't think everybody should upgrade just as it comes out, right? We have projects, we have to finish it first. You cannot give the product to people who are in the last version because you're not developing for it and you, there is no way to ship it to them. Now, only thing they can do is like copy paste files from the new version and paste into the old one, but that can almost certainly break because I'm should, could have used new API, which isn't in the old version. I could have uh, introduced bugs that they didn't expect. It wasn't in, in the old version. So it it's really becomes impossible that you are stuck with the add-on versions that just came with Blender. No matter how many bugs you have and how many bugs you need fixed, they, we can only say that if you want fix, you just have to upgrade Blender because add-ons are tied to Blender. But now, Extensions have their own release cycle. You can do whatever, whenever. You decide, you're in charge of when to work on what. And you also can release as many versions as you want for as many Blender versions as you want. You can not create like a one giant add-on, for example, that is full of if-else statements that checks Blender, uh, Blender version and just accommodates to everything from like 4.5 to uh, uh, 2.5 to 4.4. You can accommodate for everything or you can just have multiple releases for multiple versions. The extensions website also supports that. And whichever Blender version you open, you will always get up updates to your version if I push it, if I have something to update, of course. Now, in the end, oh, uh, before in the end, uh, one more question you might have is what about bugs? Because if we don't have the code review, if on extensions platform I do what I want and I'm not uh, asked to uh, or I don't ask everyone to review my stuff, there is a chance that bugs slips through, right? Because that's the whole point of reviews, to avoid that. And yes, that is true. Uh, the answer is, yeah, that's true. There are more bugs. But here's the thing about bug fixes. If in a previous system, if you were on the Blender 4.3 and discovered a bug on 
4.3, the only thing you could do is just wait till 4.4 is released. And when I pushed on August 12, when I pushed those changes to Bolto, in less than 30 minutes, they reported extremely big bug, which definitely shouldn't have uh, been in that included in that version and could have and could not have been avoided with review because it was not the co problematic code it was just a wrong algorithm which didn't produce good results but it was re uh, if it was uh, reported on august 12 the only date i could ship the new version will have been early november because i am tied to blender release cycle what happened in practice is that i fixed it next day and I, fin I fixed and I pushed the new version. So whatever the higher risk of chance there is for bugs, I think is perfectly balanced by the quick turnaround, quick fixes you can do because you can, at any point, you can do multiple releases per day. There's nothing stopping you. And in the end, I think we get much more stable result much quickly than we did before. And in the end, I get... I'm much happier because I am now working on my terms, I'm working on my, my time whenever I want. I am working in my style. I have my own coding style. I don't, I don't like, like the, the, the comment style that Blender uses. I want my own, now I can. And it is more forgiving because I am now taking more risks than I would have ever taken if I knew that like Campbell Barton is gonna review it. I can now be more forgiving, uh, more daring because I know that if something goes wrong, I don't have to stress about it. I can just fix it right away. And for users, what that meant in practice is much more updates, more frequent updates, more frequent bug, uh, bug fixes, more, more responsibly. And, and also in responsibly and user oriented, I mean that I am very open to feature requests. If you have, want anything to bootle, just tell me. Unlike Blender, I like feature requests. You can do that in Blender. We have happy developers and happy users, but why is it so important to have happy developers, right? Let them be unhappy, just give me the product. But basically for the rest of the presentation, I am just going to argue that Blender is built upon the happiness of Python developers, and we should be catered to. Now, uh, is it, yeah. This, let's start with how Blender works, who makes Blender, right? This is the theme of this, uh, uh, the, the conference of this year, like making Blender. And at the core, we have core Blender developers who are paid to work on Blender. There are very few people, like less than 50, I think, last year, they said. And full-time, they're making Blender, but there are very few groups. Fortunately, they have contributors who know C++, which is a language which Blender is written in. And let's include like the design contributors who are make, like making SVGs, icons, I've done that too. Um, but just uh, people who can and, and are willing to, most importantly, to go through that review process and go through that release cycles, dedicate their own free time to that uh, project and just uh, work as if basically they were paid developers. But then we have the much larger circle of Python developers, people who may only know Python, including me, I only know Python. And these developers are very passionate about contributing to Blender, and they are in mass numbers. I don't know exact numbers, I also say like 10 times more, let's say, just random numbers, so more than the C++ developers. And what's happening right now, not, not anymore, but what was happening before, was that basically Blender was uh, doing a, like a, a circle around the purple line and saying that if you are outside of it, like we're sorry, but you, you like appreciate the passion, but you can't really do anything. You can't really, really contribute unless like here's some hoops for you to jump through. You can do that. And what that resulted in is almost nobody contributed to Blender Python. All the add-ons that were shipped with Blender were abandoned a while ago. And I have stats for that. When we were migrating the add-ons on the extensions platform, I kind of did research on them. And out of 85 to 90, I don't remember the exact number, let's say 85, 85. out of 85 uh, add-ons that were shipped with Blender uh, that now are removed because some of them stayed, right? 60 of them, like more than two thirds, have not been updated in over a one year. And, and by meaningful update, I mean, like either bug fix or a new feature, something uh, excluding something like the uh, style changes or header changes or license changes, which user doesn't see. 
And some of them haven't been updated in the last five years. And that doesn't mean that they were so good that they didn't need uh, fixes. As we were porting, we also were discovering bugs and fixing them that people just never bothered to fix. And I also discovered that some of those add-ons that are now very famous and were shipped with Blender were actually still being developed in the original GitHub repositories of the maintainers. They were developing it, but they were not porting the changes to Blender. So what happened, like in, in my assumption, is that they didn't like abandon the project. They didn't lose passion for developing this add-on. They just lost passion for contributing to Blender. They just stopped it. They said, like, whoever finds my add-on, fine, just download GitHub, but I'm not gonna go through the Blender process again because it's a difficult process. And we ended up with a lot of unhappy people who, who were just in this outside circle, uh, just not being integrated. And from a Blender's perspective, that is waste because that's a talent that you can use because here's the thing, no matter how many people you can have in those first two circles, like Blender can go hunt people from other companies and just try to get as many C++ developers as they can, they cannot still possibly account for everything that users need. Because Blender is a generalist tool, right? It's not like a, a sub-demodeling tool or texture painting tool where you just can do like a couple of updates and that's all. Blender is used everywhere and people, how much people want no amount of developers can develop that. For example, I am facial animator. I do like stop motion stuff. If I started searching for a software and if I started bugging C++ developers that, hey, give me tools for facial animation, it will be like, yeah, but only you and like three people in France use it, so why bother? Like there's more important stuff. But I got the opportunity to work on them myself. I wanted to share it with people. I couldn't. So the people who were interested in my uh, stuff I created, just basically couldn't unless they like asked me and I pointed to them to some like external website and sometimes they paid money, why not? But those people were being wasted. And when you are a small company and when you're working on that assumption that no amount of paid developers can ba uh, basically ever uh, do all the work, you go to something that I call, perhaps uh, wrongly, but I call it asset-oriented design which is where the development is working on not necessarily the final product, but it's working on allowing users to create final product. And this is not something exclusive to Blender. The same problem of like few developers is uh, present in uh, the paid softwares as well, the ones that at least live in the century. For example, Houdini, Cinema 4D, uh, Nuke, which are the softwares I really like and admire the development. And if you see the release notes, basically half of it is just node groups. Right? They have like task forces of like 15 Simon Thompson's who are just making node groups and they're just shipping it. But Blender doesn't have that. Blender cannot afford that. But Blender has the community. So let's, let's take a, like a small uh, example of like a simplified version because that's how I understand it. Of what does the asset oriented development mean? And let's, we have one, uh, the purple, whatever that is. Let's uh, develop, let's, it represents the developer. And we have three uh, like uh, teddy bears that represent people who can't develop, but no Python or geometry nodes or whatever. So this developer is very lazy, and he has only like said that, ah, I don't like contributing much and have time. So I will just give you three days. Tell me what you want, and I will develop it, right? And we have a presentation, like or, or like a conference, and decide, okay, we want more masks in sculpt mode. We don't have enough masks, and we ask them for three masks, and he did that, does that in three days. And the rest of the people are just not doing anything. They're wasted, but they are happy, maybe, I don't know. But alternatively, what we can do is we can ask him to create mask as an attribute, which will allow those three to develop the same things that he developed. Like the first guy will develop the same stuff, but the second guy, who is maybe more into NPR, maybe more into texture painting, stylized stuff, Get, got, get the opportunity to do what is important for them without having to wait when this stuff will become important or when does the, the purple guy decides to work again. The third guy for the same, the same. And the second day, and it's a really good developer because uh, he didn't break anything on the first day, no bug fixes needed. He gets to work on a new feature. And that allows new uh, final products to be created by those teddy bears. 
And then we ask to contribute to brush assets, let's help out, and that allows those people to create brushes. And this is the real example that something uh, Hans Goody basically worked in the last couple of months. That, and those examples on the right are almost everything I made. I haven't made some of them. I just threw in to have a, like a symmetrical eyes. But I did almost everything. And by the time, in the same time the developer has spent on, which will have resulted in three final products, now have resulted in four, point, uh, four times more. Like it quantified four times. And users have, instead of three final products, like 18 final products. But you might ask a very fair question, where are they? If I created all of them, like why haven't you seen it, right? Where are those assets? Where are those... Like, uh, like extensions, let's call them. Oh, that's a very, very fair question. And it's not just the Python developers we're talking about. We're talking about the whole group of people who are really good at something in Blender, who are really good at maybe creating geometry nodes modifiers. Some of them maybe are good at uh, making rigs, and they have rigs they want to share. Maybe they have uh, great skills at making base meshes for sculpting or animation. They have good brushes, they can make alphas that they can create, why not, right? Almost everybody who uses Blender, whether it falls into the red circle or not, is an asset creator. They can all make something valuable for us. They can all share something that we can use. And they are not given a platform to do that. They're not given a space where they can share that. And we cannot just keep going to people and say, that, oh, no, you know, the, the, like the radial modifier, uh, a radial array modifier, it actually exists. It, you just have to, like, so there's this guy, Hixus, and you have to go his uh, Blender artist thread. And uh, in one of the comments, he attached a node group. And when you download, you can extract, we can, we can do that. That's not a good design, right? We need to have those people just click on a button and you have the modifier. That's as difficult as it should be. And that would fill this gap that we had here. We have the developer who's working on something that is very often called atomic features. And we have a user, but we need, in the middle, the asset creators who will cater, basically, to these users and create as many things as possible. Because uh, here's the thing. I said uh, that uh, even the paid softwares are struggling with this. Here's the advantage that Blender has that they can't have is that the lines between those three are blurred in open source projects. Anybody who's a user can become an asset creator and just share what they made. They can contribute. Developer can make assets and developer can, any line can be blurred because everybody suddenly becomes a Blender contributor. And that's where the uh, online assets come in. The extensions platform was uh, developed with add-ons and assets in mind. This is the next project. If you haven't read on the code Blender.org, there is this workshop that Blender made uh, about how online assets should work. It's fantastic design. And it uh, answers the needs of those uh, prob uh, that's not a correct wording, but anyway, uh, of those problems that uh, we discussed. And if we want this design to work, if we want to get these thousands of people who are good at rigging, modeling, sculpting, shading material stuff, if we want them to contribute, and we want, to, uh, and most importantly, we don't want them like just to upload their stuff. We want those stuff available inside Blender. This is what this design pro uh, the, the proposes. Materials, they everything, they have to be available in Blender, in Asset Browser. You, you shouldn't have to keep hunting them down on like third party websites. And if we want them to do that, we cannot restrict them. We have to give them freedom to work in their own way. We cannot, like if, if somebody makes a modifiers and they have to consult like UI module or Blender Studio every time they want to change thumbnails because it has to align with the Blender code and stuff, they will just not do it anymore. Because here's the last thing. I said it will take, take me like three to four months to uh, do the bootstool stuff instead of two weeks. That's technically a lie because knowing myself, I will have abandoned the project after one month. I will have just stopped contributing right? because that's what happens most often. That's why we get so many dead PR pull requests and dead contributions. The process is not something that non-developer is willing to go through. So what this design allows is for non-developers to still be able to contribute stuff that they want. For example, at one point, 
I, I discovered that I didn't have uh, operators in graph editor for selecting only one side of handle for all selected keyframes. There was a tool, but the defaults were something like were wrong. I didn't like it. I brought it up on a meeting. I made uh, a PR for that. And they liked it, of course. But they asked me basically that, you know, we want to make it more general. And can you do that? And it was a very fair thing to ask because you cannot just ask you uh, ask the developer to make best tool for you right we need to think about all blender users and what will be the most common use and i've never felt personally that i've been asked something like wrong or I, every time i've been asked to like change the code or extract something or I, I felt everything was fair everything was like nothing unreasonable but I just didn't want to do it. I, I, I don't, didn't want to contribute that, that much of my time. And in that particular case, I just decided to not follow up on that PR anymore because if I implemented uh, the uh, code, but it still didn't fix my personal problem, I, that means that I spent this time for me personally for nothing because I will still have to, for myself, make those tools separately. But in Sanchez platform, I can, we can have five people pushing basically the same tool, but the, the uh, catered to different types of workflows. There is no limit to how much you can personalize Blender anymore. But uh, I think it's also fair to say uh, what is the downsides of this design, right? There are many. I'm not going to talk about like the specifics, like this button should not be in a, in a drop down and stuff, like more general uh, design problems, which... Uh, of course, it's a downside that you have to click one button, uh, but uh, I mean, for most of the atmosphere, you still had to do. There's nothing changed in that matter. It's, it's not great that you have to press that button, but that's, I think, a fair price to pay for, uh, in the end, what ends up being like 10 times larger database of assets and add-ons. But one thing that can go wrong when you have 10 times large uh, the sources, basically, is that it can just get chaotic and difficult to manage because you have like, many add-ons, like dozens maybe, and assets, asset libraries just pulling from these different directions from different creators. They all have different uh, 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 repositories. They have different places where you can report bugs. Some of them ask you to like open maybe Discord or something, which you don't have. It's, it's chaotic a little bit. And this is unavoidable design every time you go into something public and something uh, where people have freedom. But we can, we can still like fight it a little bit. For example, uh, as a moderator, what I've been suggesting to many people is that if you have an add-on that like, does a small thing, like adds a new button in the node editor or something, instead of like making a new add-on for it, wouldn't, wouldn't it be better for you? Or maybe, uh, it's a question, Some, sometimes people get mad, but it's just a question. Like, wouldn't it be better if you, instead of creating a new add-on, like, uh, collaborated with someone who already has uh, maybe an add-on for arranging notes in Node Editor? Wouldn't it make more sense to have them together? And it will also mean uh, that more people will, like, al already get the access to it, right? If you have some, like, new Boolean tool, like, instead of making a new add-on, maybe it's a better idea to, like, come to me and say, hey, I want to contribute to Bullet Tool, and I say, great. And now, like, almost 2,000 people, 200,000 people, sorry, just get the access to it. You don't have to market it, anything. If this is something that many people don't want to do, and I absolutely understand that, but something I think is always, always good to keep in mind that all those extensions are still open source. They are they have the same like uh, license as Blender does. You can find those repositories, you can fork them, create your measures, or you can contribute them. You can talk to those people. They are uh, most of them are very open to this stuff. And uh, uh, out of those like sixty uh, uh, abandoned add-ons, basically, we've had people contributing to them now. Which uh, there have been. Uh, some add-ons that haven't been uh, contributed to in like three, four years. Now we have a couple of people working on it because they've suddenly realized that, oh, I can do it and I don't have to go through the, the process. I can just claim it. If I, if I prove that I can take uh, care of it, I can claim it. And I've been also helping people to like collaborate together. Like maybe like somebody had, I think, a great tool for measurements. And I said, why not put it in measure it? Like more people will access it, and that means one less add-on for you to manage. More people get it right away. That's really good. But the second problem is that 
if you go to extensions platform right now, you can find tools that, I don't know how many is it, like eight, 10? You can have per camera resolutions. There is a fantastic add-on that like you type in math equation and gives you a node tree for it. You never have to do like think about what, how to translate math. You have add-on for visualizing uh, a scientific volumetric data is like scans you do, like on brains and stuff, you can visualize it. You have Minecraft rigs, very oppo opposite to that. Uh, we have real-time motion paths, something that animate or slug. We have uh, a tool to bake animated textures with one button. We have a tool for creating custom startup files. We have uh, a gizmo for the simple deform modifier, the most reviewed one, that people love the most. We can import CSVs into geometry nodes and use however we want. We have uh, the color grading tool right in this 3D viewport. But all of them together have 50,000 downloads. And this is a lot, like 50,000 people using those tools sounds like a lot. But also the Bolt factory, which used to ship with Blender, has the same number of downloads. And I do not doubt that this is a great add-on. And thanks to the people who are contributing to Bolt factory, but I do not believe that this is happening because more people need Bolt Factory because uh, more than they need uh, the other ones. Uh, there are so many animators out there that will love some of them, but I think the problem is that, that you don't know about them because in total they have zero YouTube videos except like one or two that developers made with like 10 or 15 views. None of those are documented well enough and people do not know that you can just go into preferences, type in real life motion pass, and click it, and then you have real time motion pass. How cool is that, right? But if people don't know this, like what's the point of creating this whole <laughs> design if people still use both factory only? But this is a problem that even though like Blender can do something to promote some stuff better, this is not something that Blender or Extensions Platform or even the add-in developers themselves in most cases can solve because Speaking for myself and probably some others too, I don't want to do marketing. I do not enjoy it. I don't like it. I just want to share a tool and say, let's, anybody can use it. No problem. And right now, I basically have to market this sometimes, uh, somehow, but there's this one more line in this uh, circle of Blender makers, which are educators, people who teach Blender, people who make uh, like videos about it, right? The Blender's popularity is very tied to this uh, surge of YouTube videos. And I feel like that this group has not been pulling their weight. I don't wanna go into rant, but like honestly, like how many beginner sculpting tutorials do we need, guys? There are, this is untapped market. I understand that this is not like fancy, maybe very uh, uh, enticing to make videos where you don't get like referral money and stuff, but this is a market. Like each of those can have thousands and tens of thousands of users if you just let them know that they can use it, but nobody does. And I, I wanted to like basically have a call to people, just spread a word about it. And have a browse in it, have, see what you can do and how much potential is there that you can just tell people about and get, get more excitement about those add-ons and maybe um, they also have some sometimes uh, uh, contribution links, maybe you can do that too. So this is like very simplified version, I may be wrong one too, like how to, how to contribute to Blender, what you can do. But this is not the end of it, right? After the educators, like the whole darkness, the whole uh, grayness of it, it's just Blender users who make uh, like bug reports, who test, who uh, like leave a good review on extension. It feels very good when you get a five star, do that often. Uh, or just, I don't know, spread a good word about it. Everybody makes Blender from the core. If you, the point being, no matter what you do, Blender gives you ability to contribute in your way, on your, on your terms, however it is convenient for you, you can contribute. Anybody can find themselves on these charts, but if you can't, and I will end this with this, there is always, uh, what is it called? The fund uh, blender.org. You can always just contribute money or uh, contribute money to Adam developers as well. Right, that if you have for some reason questions for me, you can ask. Or otherwise, uh, that's it from me. Okay. okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, uh, however you want. Yes. Resolver, and I fully understand the decision to not want to go into that at all. But I am a little curious if there is any sort of vision in this assets-based development world where every user can also contribute something. Is there any vision for reuse between these assets? Right. I think uh, the term we use are we. <laughs> oh my goodness! How? <laughs> Right, so the question is about that a lot of add-ons that, for example, the one that uses uh, scientific uh, visualization use uh, dependencies, that which what we call wheels, right, in, uh, in our terminology. We, sh we ship them as well. Shipping is probably not the correct word, but we, we treat them as wheels and we keep them. And that have been, I, I can say to you, the, the biggest headache for uh, the moderating. Uh, and I, I cannot answer that because I, I forgot to say, actually, I don't represent Planner. I don't work, I haven't consulted anyone about this translation. Uh, so uh, I think from what I've talked to people and from what they t said to me, uh, the idea just is to like test the grounds and see which dependencies are needed enough to be included in Blender because there are some that are like NumPy and stuff are already uh, inside Blender then add-on developers don't have to bundle them or anything and don't care about versions and stuff. So if something becomes uh, important enough and reused a lot of times, Blender said that they are opening to uh, uh, including them inside Blender. So, but I think Two add-ons using the same one sadly will not make the case like to have them. But I also don't think that's too big of a problem because, uh, yeah, it adds like a couple of megabytes. But uh, realistically, you don't. As on a user side, it's something we care about more, like developers, right? Uh, but on user side, they they don't really care as, as long as they get the result. I don't think they are much interested in where these dependencies are coming from. Right, anything else? Okay. I, I can hear you, I can repeat. I think that one is shipped. I think that one is shipped with Blender, actually. Uh, but that's a good question. So uh, the question is that uh, how uh, th there's a kind of a problem for large add-ons who want to convert to extensions because uh, there is uh, basically a lot of uh, overload of managing the wheels and uh, keeping up with the new versions and stuff. That has came up a couple of times. And I'm not qualified enough to say because I, I don't know how working with wheels or like scripts was before. 
that's the thing. I, I don't have experience because I've, uh, before extensions platform, I haven't worked with something that needed external dependencies that didn't came with Blender. But that is a very fair question. And uh, also, I maybe like how it was previously was that uh, Blender would install all the wheels uh, in the same package, right? So that add-ons could reuse it or instead of like downloading and they could just check uh, and see if uh, this even needs to be updated and stuff. And I think maybe something like that can be developed. This is still a, like a new system. And uh, to be honest, we didn't have a lot of add-ons that had dependencies. And the, 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 the other part of your question uh, that was about like the 400 files and development stuff, anything goes. Like however you want to develop it, however you want to manage it, as long as like it doesn't break some rules, uh, like license, for example, you don't ship any file that uh, like isn't compatible with GPL, or you, um, I, I don't, I don't even know what could break it. In most, mo like ninety percent of the percent of time, whatever you do is allowed. But also, most of these rules we have aren't for the extensions; they are for the extensions platform. So basically, they are f for uploading just on that website. If you don't want to upload that, or if you can't, but some people just can't because they don't have correct licenses for some dependencies, right? You can use any other uh, uh, market or like uh, place you want. Uh, there, there are some uh, paid extensions platforms coming up that use the same system, same drag and drop, the same like the manifest and all that. And you can also make your own ones freely and you, they will benefit from absolutely everything same. So even if you somehow, I will doubt it, but if you somehow fail to update correctly, you can always just do it your way and uh, forget what Blender suggests, but host it on your own, uh, on your own repository. It will not be great, obviously, but the uh, good thing is that there is always a workaround for every issue. Yeah, okay, yeah. No, they will be supported for a very long time. I don't think they have like near future plans to remove that, right? I, at least for next couple of years, I'll like five years, I wouldn't expect that they will go out of the way. Basically, if you want to ex uh, upgrade to extension, if you don't want to upgrade to your extension, that, as far as I'm concerned, means that you just cannot use extensions platform. But anywhere you want to put it, because the extensions platform will ask you for wheels, right? But if you don't want that, still do your job. We will not stop you. Obviously, we can't. But you will just not be able to use the platform. That's the limitation, yeah. Sadly. Okay. Uh, okay, one more. No, oh, oh, you can't. You can't. We have very general and oh yeah, right. Uh, so the question was that if I have an add-on that uh, basically comes with the blend files that have geometry nodes in it, and they are not assets, the uh, add-on uses them. Can I ship them or not? You can. We have no restrictions of what the code can do. But here's the thing: importing, like appending, correct term from uh, the blend file, is allowed. Having notes in the blend file obviously is allowed, so you can't possibly break any rules. However, uh, if add-on like doesn't need to be, uh, if the asset library doesn't need to be an add-on, if it's just assets, it's probably better to just do it as an uh, asset library in the future. But for example, the, the scientific data one that I said, not only does it comes with the range of geometry nodes, but not only does it append them, it creates like a UI for them where it allows you to like uh, upload scientific stuff and things like that. So it's important in that case. And also one of the like proto-official add-on, which should be uh, published any day now, which Simon Tom's made for Blender Studio, does exactly the same. It's a geometry nodes modifier that is appended and has a UI. So. 
Yeah. I think there's a lot of speculation about how strict we are. We are not. We are not at all. Okay. I will. Is there? Okay. One more, and then I will finish. Okay. Yeah. And in the end, uh, in an extension of the system, you could face a situation where you would like to install two very nice extensions or don't, and then one of them is working on latest PS version, and now it's working on latest mono PS release, and another one actually requires you to install Alpha Beta. Yes. So uh, the question is if uh, like uh, the add-ons can have uh, four different Blender versions, different Python versions, right? Uh, because the Python also is something that up updates and Blender is uh, shipped with Python a certain version, each version. And at some point it might happen that for like the next one, they decide that now we are going for, with Python 3.14. And what that means for developers who wanted to support the two versions at the time. The most honest version, uh, answer I can give you is that I don't know yet because that haven't happened. But the thing is that uh, we had problems uh, very recently, like last week, I think, about uh, add-ons uh, trying to like convince uh, people at Blender that let me allow to use the new Python version. But the answer to that is that Blender is sticking with the VFX reference platform, I think it's called, which has a certain guideline that this is the Python version that shall be used. And Blender takes that seriously. So any version that comes with that uh, has to stick with the Python version as well. If you have something that needs Python version, you simply cannot use it. But uh, that, I remember, was discussed what will happen if I have to support multiple versions. I, I don't know. I, I don't think it has been decided yet because I for like next year and a half, Python version isn't going to change. But when that happens, my assumption will be that you will have to make a cut. You'll have to have add-ons uh, for versions with like uh, 3.13 and ones for 3.14. I think that's going to be on the limitation. Yeah. But that's not something that Blender controls. OK. So I will finish there. Thank you very much for being here. Don't forget the message. And see you around. Okay.